All right, so I did get a little bit further in... <laughs> what the hell? Is that artifacting that happens? Okay, I did get a little bit further in um, working on my account of uh, sort of the foundations of mathematics here. Um, I am still at a point where I'm not 100% satisfied with uh, where we're at, but I feel like that's a good thing. I feel like that's a virtue to come up with something and look at it and be like, hmm, I don't know that I have this 100% right. It's probably a virtue because it means that you're still working on it. You're still you're still willing to be like, hey, there's there might be problems with this, or you know maybe there aren't. I don't fucking know. That's why it got to this point and not further yet. All right, so I have it broken into sections with centered titles with these um, pretty little things marking it off. All right, so founding concepts in order of derivation. So as we go down the page, um, the whole way through, things become more and more derived from what was up above it. Okay. As a general rule, some of the things you could probably move around a little bit, but as a general rule, the further down it is on the page, the more derived it is. Um, so this first part, is going to be identifying units and reference frames. And you might notice offhand that numbers are not involved. <laughs> okay, so starts with a feature. This I don't think this has changed from before. Um, it, this is a measurable detail of something and I have a note here that I'm not entirely satisfied with this. Um, it may just be that I'm not satisfied with this definition because it is exceptionally vague but probably needs to be, so, I don't know. And then a dimension, uh, this is a collection of features. I changed this name, I think it had a category before. I changed it to dimension because I feel like dimension, that term more accurately aligns with uh, conventional mathematics and parlance. Because, yeah, in mathematics, category is a thing and it's not what I'm talking about. Dimension is much, much closer. And very quickly, it turns out that I need to talk about dimensions anyway in a more or less classical mathematical sense. So might as well, like, this is the place, I think, to introduce it. So um, a feature on its own is a dimension, but most dimensions are collections of multiple features. Right. So like, uh, you could think of, um, mass as a feature, but uh, Newton, the unit Newton, is a collection of multiple uh, features like that, right? So if your SI units are features, a Newton is a derived complex of SI units, right? So it's a collection of SI units or a collection of features, if we're considering the SI units to be features. Um, distinct dimensions lie perpendicular to each other. And this is necessarily always true, it's, um, which is why, like, if you're in one dimension, operating, moving along different values in that dimension, it, unless there is some function relating that movement to movement in another dimension, um, your movement in that first dimension will not affect movement in the other dimensions, and vice versa, which means they must be perpendicular to each other, right? So distinct perp distinct dimensions lie perpendicular to each other. That That is, I'm comfortable with that axiom. Uh, then we get to units, and uh, a way to think of this is it's an indivisible exemplar of a dimension. Or, because this is not necessarily a reasonable way to go about it. A chosen standard which possesses features of a dimension. And then we're going to get into that in a second. Or in the abstract, it's a schema that, of a dimension's features. Right? So like a detail of which features um, make up this this dimension. Right? So like converting Newtons to SI units, for instance, that that conversion, which really isn't a conversion. Like you're just saying like, yeah, Newtons made up of kilograms and seconds and, you know, 
other unit, like, it's not a base unit, it's made up of other stuff, that kind of a thing. So, you can have Newton be the unit without talking about one Newton specifically. That's where the abstract versus concrete comes in. The concrete would be one Newton specifically, and the abstract would be Newton is the unit that we're using. Um, and then here, you uh, to see if something is a unit, you need to identify if it fits the given dimension, and either identify or define if it is indivisible. Now, th this is where it's important. So units of length, for instance, must be defined. So this is where it gets to a chosen standard which possesses features of a dimension. Uh, that, that right there. Um, yeah, so units of length, for instance, must be defined as dimensions of length are either continuous or at least effectively continuous at useful scales, whereas other dimensions might be discrete, like the lynx dimension, right? The, the wild cat lynx, right? Um, which indicates the presence of lynx. And being living animals, lynx are fundamentally indivisible, as a portion of a lynx is no longer a lynx at all, right? A foot of a lynx is not a lynx. Right. So, <coughs> you have a three-legged lynx running around. That missing leg doesn't doesn't make a second lynx. Right. You still just have that original first one. Um, and, right. So, they're indivisible in the sense that you can't just, like, chop it in half and get two of them. Right. But you can have a damaged individual that isn't a whole necessarily typically whole individual and it's still an individual within you know whatever i'm not going to get into that but i think you're familiar with that a three-legged dog is still a dog a neutered male is still a male <laughs> uh units which must be defined do not identify distinct dimensions okay so, yeah, uh, carry on. But instead coexist among an infinitude of similar units with incommensurate scaling in parallel dimensions. So this is like inches versus centimeters versus miles versus light years, whatever, right? These parallel dimensions may even be so incommensurately scaled as to point in opposite directions. So this is going to set up in a moment, the difference between positive and negative, and the fact that those are units. Those are features of the unit, not anything else. Okay. So this is important here because these units, um, which must be defined, they are not identifying distinct dimensions, and what that means is these sorts of things lie parallel to each other not perpendicular they're not distinct dimensions that lie perpendicular to each other you can convert an inch into a centimeter right you cannot convert a lynx into a mile right? those are distinct but an inch and a centimeter and a kilometer and a mile and whatever those are parallel because those are defined units. Lynx is, um, it's an indivisible exemplar of a dimension. It fits this, right? So this is a quantized or a discrete sort of dimension, whereas length is um, a continuous sort of dimension. All right, and then commensurate, I already used the word, so I feel weird that it's here, but we, uh, yeah. <laughs> one of these had to be defined first. So they're, they're kind of in a circular loop of which one gets to go first. So just make a choice. Commensurate. Yeah, this is units of parallel dimensions with identical scaling. However, they might have opposite orientation. So this is where the a, a positive inch and a negative inch, these are commensurate because we can operate within both of them at the same time as if we're just operating in one unit but really they are different from each other because of the orientation they are different units from each other because of the orientation but 
they are their scaling is exactly the same and they lie within a p parallel dimension thus they are commensurate with each other they are interchangeable in some sense um, now we get into the first things that will typically be identified as numbers although these are actually not numbers yet at this point zero this is the absence of units and this is also um, the intersection between distinct dimensions uh, one is the presence of a unit uh, one and unit share the same root morpheme for this reason origin and this is very closely related to zero uh, this is the location where all possible dimensions intersect and this includes parallel dimensions zero in absolutely every possible dimension occurs at the origin right so not all intersecting dimensions are necessarily distinct for instance incommensurate parallel units will intersect at the origin right but also lie within the same space so inches versus centimeters is an example of this these units are parallel because they both indicate distance but they are incommensurate because one inch is not the same as one centimeter and finally the parallel dimensions these units describe intersect at the origin because zero inches is exactly identical to zero centimeters so these dimensions these parallel dimensions that these units are describing do still intersect at the origin even though they're they're parallel dimensions you think well if they're parallel they could surely slide along each other right no <laughs> no all dimensions intersect at the origin um, the origin now here we get into where it gets interesting and you can play with it and do fun things like physicists like to do um, which makes the world much much easier or engineers um, the origin may be an arbitrary point that can be altered for convenience and that is an important thing to keep in mind because um, choosing the origin can make your day way harder than it needs to be if you choose it wrong <laughs> or you know if you choose it unwisely right because ultimately we're all terrible at math and we just have a few uh, tricks here and there that we can work with so if those tricks become hard to use or if you can't figure out how to use them maybe just move your origin <laughs> a lot of times that helps um, reference frame a specific choice of origin and orientation of the positive directions for each dimension that's a reference frame um, and now we get into a set um, and a set is a collection of identified generally concrete I think that's probably always gonna be units um, if we are working in a dimension with the features domesticated and canid for instance then we might name the dimension dog and for convenience the unit of this dimension would also be named dog and thus a collection of dogs would be a set of dogs such a set operates much like it does under a classical set theory with the notable exception that it is not a primitive structure as you note it is at the bottom of this first section <laughs> it has been derived from everything up above it um, it is not a primitive structure and no set is infinitely large a priori that is an important point as well as sets are constructed abstraction layers an infinitely large set must be justifiably constructed to be infinitely large all right now we get to the second section which is the first order operation notice it is singular um, and that our operation is crementation and this introduces numbers um, so crement this is changing a set by one unit as far as I know this isn't a standard word but if you've looked ahead or if you're willing to just wait a moment this will make sense as a word um, so this is adding or removing one unit to a set incrementation is collecting identified units into a set as each one is identified and an increment can be a verb or a noun and this is increasing a set by one unit decrementation is removing a unit from a set a decrement is to decrease the set by one unit and what these have in common if we knock off those prefixes is the word crement so we can increment and we can decrement so we should be able to just crement 
Uh, this one isn't terribly important, but I threw it in just to show like future expansion poss possibilities here. Uh, some, right? So we can. It would be nice if we could sort of define a natural language looking thing with this. So that's what I was thinking here. Some. Um, this is the presence of more than one unit. Right, that's that's it. We have we have already established what one is. We have established what a group of things is, a set. Um, so we can we can have a presence of more than one thing. That's fine. So that's what sum is. Um, positive and negative. Um, positive. These are both units oriented in specific directions. Positive is in oriented towards increasing, and this is used while incrementing. And generally, this is the natural orientation of your reference frame. Negative is unit oriented toward decreasing, and it is used while decrementing. And this is generally the inverse orientation of your reference frame. Inverse, and again, like, I already used the word, but meh. Um, so here, this is units of parallel dimensions which exactly match each other in scale, but have opposite direction. So this one I probably could have moved up, but probably more, most properly I, I should have set this higher up, I think, um, because I think this this is possible to uh, to define without, before this point. Anyway, um, so positive is the inverse of negative, and negative is the inverse of positive, since positive and negative are parallel dimensions, and rather than perpendicular, and the negative of a unit is exactly the same scale as the positive unit, uh, just pointing in the opposite direction. And now we can get into numbers. So a number is the size of increase of a set from zero. So we have to have a concept like sets. It may not necessarily have to be sets exactly, but something like that, roughly like what I've defined. Um, and we have to have the idea of increasing, of growing, and we have to have our starting point from zero to get numbers. And uh, generally what we're going to do is we're going to name these for convenience, and I've already gone over this, and I'm sure you're aware of how numbers work, but um, just to make this painfully obvious that this is distinct from Pano, um, zero is actually defined as something. It is a complete lack of units, and as we noted up above, it is where the dimensions intersect, it is where your origin occurs. Um, even when you have parallel dimensions, like inches and kilometers, the zero is an intersection point for those things. So zero is very, very important. It is very well defined, and it is very important to keep track of. And uh, the operations uh, pretty much always are related to zero. Um, at the base level in some way or other. As you can see here, a number is defined as being the size of increase of a set from zero. So zero is very, very important. Okay, And one is when we have the presence of a unit. And this is, this is also important because this establishes what all of the other numbers are going to be. So this is not a number unto itself. This is much more fundamental and much more important. It is not simply the successor to zero, right? Peano's logic is circular because what he did is he presumed what one was and then he said, oh, well, z one itself is just zero plus one and zero is just the thing that doesn't have, nothing takes it as a successor, which that's circular. When you look at it, that's circular bullshit. That's not possible. I have an angry rabbit. I don't think it likes my voice right now. Um, but then, from this point on, we get into something that looks very much like piano, right? We're basically looking at the successor of 1 is 2, the successor of 2 is 3, the successor of 3 is 4, etc. That's really pretty much what's happening here. And I think this is why piano blinded everybody, why pretty much everybody was like, oh yeah, he's right. Because, for the most part, he is. It's just, setting up the base, he isn't. And that's where shit hits the fan. When, 
that's what I think I'm pretty sure a lot of the paradoxes related to Peano arithmetic uh, derive from the fact that it wasn't set up, it wasn't founded correctly. Um, yada yada, so at this point, blah blah blah, I've read through this already. Um, vectors, so this is a specific number of units. Okay, so we've just described, we've just defined number as these guys. So a vector is a number of units, right? So when you have four dogs, that's a vector, okay? So since crementation works over single units, incrementation and decrementation work over vectors, not numbers. Um, count. So this one uh, can be a verb or I think I have lower as a noun. Um, verb definition is much longer. So this is where we step through the list of number names while crementing. Incrementing, uh, incrementation is the default direction of movement, and decrementation through the number names is also counting, right? This is, this is pretty much why it's important that we have the word crement as a single thing, right? So we don't have to say incrementing or decrementing. Like, it's just why just crementing? We're crementing. We're moving by one. Um, so this yields an ordered set, but this ordering is not a property of the set itself. Um, instead, it is a consequence of the units comprising the set, pointing to each other as a matter of their own definitions. Right, so we can say something like, let natural numbers be the name of the set of named numbers. It will be a consequence of the definition of these named numbers that zero is the first unit or the first member of that set. That's what unit here means. Um, it's a unit in that set. All right. uh, as it denotes nothing, while every other named number denotes something. Similarly, it will be a consequence of the definitions that one is the second unit, as it denotes something, but does not indicate where it came from, while every other named number denotes where it came from in an unbroken chain back to one. After this point, it is trivial to see that what the order should be. But importantly, the set itself is naturally unstructured. The order arises from the units themselves. For this reason, we do not require a theory of data structures. Um, and then notably, this means that arriving at the natural numbers this way is distinct from the way they are arrived at by Peano's axioms, because one is not circularly defined as the successor to zero as it is by Peano. Uh, under Peano's axioms here, we have uh, zero is set as the starting point by declaring that the successor of a number can never be zero, but zero is otherwise undefined. Under Peano's axioms, the successor of zero is one because the successor of a number is the number plus one, and a number plus zero is the number, but one is otherwise undefined. Peano's axioms producing systems of arithmetic plagued with paradoxes, should this not be remotely surprising? Because if you look at this, if you look at this carefully, you will see that it is legitimately circular. It is nonsense. It is malformed. Charlie, calm down. Um, counting as the noun, right, count. Uh, this is the number name at a specific step in counting. Um, counter. This is a single unit set containing an indication of what it is counting, the unit, uh, in which direction, positive versus negative, and the current count, the number name. Coordinate system. This is a conventionalized abstraction of a reference frame with a highly limited number of dimensions. By default, using an, or an origin and generic commensurate unit for all dimensions, which is intended to capitalize on the benefits of using numbers. For instance, the two or three dimensional coordinate systems used in conventional geometry nearly universally use a common unit of length for all dimensions. These are not reference frames because the origin is chosen out of convenience rather than physically dictated fact and most dimensions are ignored with those being used often using either commensurate units or units which can be usefully related to each other uh, in a manner which yields a new unit that is a simple superposition of the base units. Uh, I'm not going to get into that because this, this video is already going long enough, but yeah. Um, I, I think you can see like inches should be parallel to inches, 
but in a two-dimensional grid you have one inch dimension that is perpendicular to another inch dimension right so there's clearly something else going on there right uh, second order operation again notice there's only one of them vector consolidation so rabbit chill add this is where we simultaneously count to the first number we are given and starting at the second number we increment with each increment um, <laughs> and addition is the nominal form of that the sum is the result of addition so the sum of two and three is five or this so yeah from zero we count up to two and as we're doing that we count from three up and where we end that's our result right so we started at zero importantly that's not written here but we do we start at zero and we count up to two which is this guy and at the same time we start at three and count along as we count up to two and where we end that is our result subtraction is basically the same yada yada we start at zero count to two and here we start at five and count down along with it right and the thing we end on is the difference the but these can be unified. Okay, first subtraction is the inverse of addition. Addition is the uh, uh, inverse of subtraction. That should be inverse. Addition of negative subtraction is subtraction. Okay, yeah. Note that these two operations can be unified, in which case there is no inverse operation, only a switch between inverse units. So if we have something like this, you can step through it this way. And I'll let you pause and look at that if you want to. Um, this clearly demonstrates that the positive and negatives are not numbers, but vectors. And thus the classical set of integers is not a set of numbers, but a set of vectors. If one is a number, and positive one is a number, and negative one is a number, then equally one dog must be a number, and one pint of whiskey is also a number, and thus the name number must clearly be completely vacuous, as it is now impossible to discern what the fuck it means. In short... Everybody who told you that negative numbers are numbers was retarded. The third order operations, multiplication and division. Here, so this hasn't really changed from before, but I do want to point out that if you look at them, there is a legitimate difference. Okay? So, here, we are incrementing 0, 1, 2. And here, we are adding... 0, 3, 6. These get swapped. These columns get swapped in the inverse, right? 6, 3, 0. We go in the opposite order. 0, 1, 2. This one stays in the same order, but it is that first column in multiplication becomes the second column in division, and the second column in multiplication becomes the first column in division, and it's inverted. So these are actually different operations from each other. These are, these cannot be unified. Calm down, rabbit. Um, fourth order operations, exponentiation and taking logarithms. And it still pains me that there isn't an actual just verb for that. Exponentiate, blah, blah, blah. Same sort of thing, I've shown this before. Um, and again, the same sort of thing. Notice this first column becomes the second column and the second column flips over and becomes the first column. So this is, taking a logarithm is the inverse of exponentiation in exactly the same way that division is the inverse of multiplication. Right, algorithmically, they are inverses of each other. And here LB indicates the log base two. It's just much shorter to write it that way. So that's why that's in there if you're not familiar with that. Um, consequences of exponentiation, the so-called complex numbers and quaternions. And this one I haven't gotten too far on. So, yeah. I, a unit that is the square root of negative 1. Because it is not possible to find a square root of negative 1 within the reals, so that is like along the dimension that we set up with just positives and negatives, I must be the unit of a perpendicular dimension to the reals. 
which is conventionally named the imaginaries. There are always more possible dimensions perpendicular to the reals, so we may invoke any number of dimensions whose units are the square root of negative one, as is convenient. And if the reals and one imaginary dimension are taken together, they form the complex plane, they're vectors within which are named complex numbers. They're vectors, they're not complex numbers, they're not numbers. That's, that's a, the wrong word. But, it's fine. We're used to, if you're, if you're familiar with complex numbers, you're used to thinking of them as vectors anyway, so... Meh. <laughs> this shouldn't break your mind too much. Um, if the reals and three imaginary dimensions, classically named i, j, and k, are taken together, they form a four-dimensional space, vectors within which are named quaternions. And that is the point to which I have gotten, and I believe it is more coherent than the bullshit which is currently considered the foundation of mathematics. But I also do not believe that I have uh, finished this. I, there's definitely more that I've not got to.